Our epistle text for today is taken from the epistle to the Galatians, the fifth chapter, and going into the sixth chapter, we start with verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Heavenly Father, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What we have in front of us is not a normal text to be preached on, but we're going to do it anyway, because that's the way we come to roll around here. Um, and what I mean by that is it's a sanctification text. Well, what does that mean, Pastor? It's a text that addresses how God wants us to live holy and spiritual. That word sanctification is thrown into what the work of the Holy Spirit is, right? To make us holy, to guide us in Christian living. And so we're not going to get a real great gospel message in this text. And we, I'm not going to preach a, gospel, a sermon that does not have gospel. Trust me, I won't do that. And so we're going to start off first with that. Because if we aren't building on what the gospel has given us, God's only compounding laws on us, isn't he? But this is a text about living in the spirit, in the grace of God that the Holy Spirit has given to us, knowing that our Savior suffered and died to pay for our sins. And that grace freely given, the gift of God not by works so that no one can boast, is already assumed. Paul does this quite often. Earlier in his epistles, he's always talking about grace and sin and the law and the difference between the law and the gospel. But at the end of his epistles, he's often talking about, make sure you're taking care of this and this and this, giving instructions to those he already knows are believers in Christ. And so we have to take a look at this. We're going to take a look at this. What are the lessons in spirituality that Paul encourages us and instructs us in as much as he did the Galatian Christians? And again, we start off with that presumption, don't we? If we live in the Spirit, if we are called by the Holy Spirit, given faith, then let us also walk in the Spirit. He says the same thing in the book of Galatians, in Ephesians. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. He doesn't want us to have any problems that we create in the church. People being envious of one another. Thinking highly of themselves. In fact, we're going to address that twice. Not provoking one another. 
And then we get one of the big lessons of our text. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. <clears throat> As a pastor, I've seen this play out in churches. God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. And so what do we have to be careful to do in the church? If somebody is caught in a sin, we need to, with gentleness, correct them. Hoping that the easiest way to restore the situation restores the situation. And you might be thinking to me, wait a minute, what's going on? I'll give you an example. In my first church, some of the previous pastors had let something go. And so I happened to inherit a situation where people who were living in open sin were allowed to come to communion. Because so-and-so got away with it. How come we can't get away with it? And we see this in our world today in so many churches, don't we? Well, we have to have compassion on the person. They should come to the Lord's Supper. They should come and be part of everything in our church. But if you're living in sin and you're away from God, and if the church says, oh, that's fine, how long before the whole church isn't away from God? Do you see the slope? <laughs> the dangers on either side. What Paul is addressing here. Correct them. Don't allow the situation to keep going, lest you also be tempted. In fact, what is he warning? That more people are going to join in that same sin if it's just let go. And if everybody's caught up in sin then, because we've all embraced it, how long are we not with God any longer? We have a responsibility for the church, for our children, to call sin, sin. And yet he does encourage us with compassion, with gentleness to do this. Some would look at us and say, oh, that church doesn't love people. They don't embrace the sinner. We embrace the sinner. We don't embrace the sin. Because we need someone to wash our sins away. That's why we have to start with the gospel too, don't we? Before we go through some of these rules, we have to remember Jesus was concerned about the sinner. But he never said, go on and keep living in sin. What did he tell the woman? Go and sin no more. The man who we cleansed and healed at the pool, he said, don't get into any worse sins because something worse could happen to you. Never did he say, go and sin all you want. In fact, Paul himself addresses that. Well, should we sin the more so that grace more abounds? Absolutely not. But that we walk spiritually, still embracing God's word, not throwing it away. Bear one another's burdens. It's kind of interesting because he seems to say the opposite thing. First, he tells us to bear one another's burdens. 
and then he tells us to carry our own load. And we might be thinking, wait a minute, how can he say both of these things to us? What is he talking about? Well, if you look at Christ, you see him bearing his cross. Even after he's been whipped and scourged and lost so much blood, beaten and mocked, Till he could not do it anymore. And had someone help him carry the cross for him. Jesus is reminding us that I bore the burden for you. And to have a loving heart to help others as I have helped you out. I have lifted you up. I have washed you clean. But he also says to us, bear your own burden. Don't stick something else, something that you're supposed to be doing, off on somebody else. And there's the spirituality of this, isn't there? Well, do I have to do stuff? I see this in my house when dad says, let's, uh, okay, guys, let's get something done here. You usually see one or two kind of dragging their feet a little bit. And so both are really true, aren't they? If you're supposed to be bearing your burden and you're not cutting it, that's wrong. But also know that sometimes someone's burden might be too heavy for them. And he's also telling us to be compassionate. Building one another up. He has a passage in here about the worker in the church. Those who preach and teach are worthy of their wages. And I would say with anything, the worker is worth its wages. There's even rules in the Old Testament about when your oxen are plowing, don't muzzle them. Let them eat the grain or whatever they're plowing or harvesting. Because they deserve to eat for the work that they're doing. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And he talks about reaping. Are we here to satisfy our flesh and live for the things of the flesh? And it's interesting that he would have to go back and say this, isn't he? Isn't it? Yet so many who claim to preach in God's name, who stand in front of people with thousand dollar suits, with airplanes so that they can do the ministry quicker. Are they really in it for the work of the Lord? Or are they growing rich off of it? It's kind of interesting that we, if you've grown up in the TV evangelist era, You've seen the corruption that's happened and the sinful lifestyles that many of them have led. So Jesus reminds us through the Apostle Paul to stay spiritual. That there are things that we will reap towards everlasting life. And in doing good, in being a light to the world around us, we hope and we rejoice that for every one sinner who repents and comes to God. Because the angels in heaven dance for joy. You want know, to talk about a legacy that we could give? that we make a difference to even just one person. 
and how they might make a difference to one person and one person and one person. And guess what? All of a sudden, there's a whole group. My grandfather fought the Japanese in World War II. And then he was stationed there for over a month before he could get shipped back to the United States. And he gained a respect for the Japanese people. When he got back to the United States, he married my grandmother, started having kids, got involved in his church, even taught Sunday school. And he took great pride in this, that in teaching Sunday school, one of the kids that he taught was missionary Haben, who went and started the Japanese mission work in Japan. What a coincidence, huh? What an incredible thing that in doing what we are supposed to be doing in sharing the gospel and teaching it to our children and the children of our congregations, what we might be doing that has such incredible spiritual heavenly results. How incredible. So God encourages us in this. Don't grow tired of doing good, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. One of the hardest things that I've sometimes had to deal with as a pastor is when somebody's hurt, they don't always come to church. When somebody's looking for love, as the song goes, they look for it in all the wrong places, don't they? Anyone, anything, anybody who will love me. Even if they get mistreated. And I've wondered, how, how do you reach some people sometimes? Because the church should be the place where they go for comfort. Where they can go and feel the embrace of the Lord. As he comes to us every week and says, I love you. I know your pain. I've been there. I've faced it. I know what it's like. And that's not enough for some people. My grace is sufficient for you, God tells us. My strength, not yours, not figure it out on your own. My grace is sufficient for you. And so again, we are not going to just have a service here where we're talking about all the rules that God instills in us. We are going to have a gospel sermon. And we end there with my grace is sufficient for you. Have you thought about this? That God's grace is sufficient for you. But that God's grace in you might be sufficient for somebody else. That the help that God wants for someone might come through me. And how precious is it when that happens? That we reap with eternal results. That God has not only connected us to him, but to his very work on earth. 
and the Lord my God be praised. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, let that peace be with our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.